understand the person of Jesus. Let's look at Matthew 16 verse 13. Don't worry. Five minutes to rounding up will shift the atmosphere. <laughs> you know, dealing with the needs of men are the easiest things. If men are taught truth and they are raised, a lot of things will no longer be necessary. I'm telling you. I can come here now and charge through a teaching and release power of God. You may need me again. Or you keep needing pastor to pray every day. But if you know what I'm teaching you, you will come here because you love God. You will serve because you love God. You will become the testimony that God is faithful. Glory to God. Jesus was speaking in Matthew 16 verse 13. He said, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say I, the son of man, I am? If you read this scripture, something will shock you. That the whole generation didn't know him. Meanwhile, if you come into the synagogue, there were people with gray hair and beard that is as long to their chest level. They carry the Torah and move about with it. They are strange creatures to behold. In fact, when they go to the market and they are coming home, they wash their feet, their hands and their legs because they've taught sinners. High level religious men, but they didn't know him. Look at all of the answers that were gathered from the predominant school of thought. He said, and they said, some say. When they say some say, these are not individuals. Though. These are schools of thought. These are theological seminaries of those days. He says, some say, you are John the Baptist. Why are they saying so? Because they thought that he came back to life from the dead. And because of the power over death, they assume he was the one. They say, some say, you are Elias. That's Elijah. Because of the miracles. Only Elijah could have prayed that level of miracle. He says, some say you are Jeremiah. Because of righteous teaching. He looks at the Pharisees and says, you are hypocrite. You know, Jeremiah is a prophet of truth. When he preaches, people weep. So when they were judging him, they were judging him from the periphery. And others said, you are one of the prophets. So they scaled him at the level of a prophet. That was their biggest revelation of Jesus. Jesus now turned to his own disciples and asked them, since they don't know, let's assume that the whole institution is a waste of money and time. You that have followed me up to now, who do you say I am? Everybody kept quiet because even they too didn't know. That you are around does not mean you know. It must be revealed to you. This is why you have to humble yourself. You know, people come to church and act like peacock. They know everything. You are joking. <laughs> that you are around does not mean you know. It must be revealed. So you need humility. Peter spoke and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus looked at him and said, You didn't answer this from your brain. Because you too don't know it. Flesh and blood have not revealed this to you. He said, my father which is in heaven has revealed this to you. And he said, upon this revelation you have brought, <laughs> I will build my church and the gate of hell shall not prevail. Now, the first thing Jesus showed us here is that when you know me, you have moved from the level of deliverance. You have moved to a level where Satan can afflict you. He said, the gate of hell shall not prevail. Now, when we cast out devils and do deliverance, it looks beautiful. But Jesus is saying, the true knowledge of Jesus is beyond that realm. You come to a place where no weapon fashioned against you shall prosper. So you don't even have need to be delivered in the first place. You become fortified like a fortress. The whole gate of hell. He's not saying one demon. He's not saying one principality. In case the whole government of hellfire rises against you, they say all the attacks will be futile. You may not even notice that Satan is fighting. That's the excellency of knowing Jesus. It brings you to a place where you become a wonder to your generation. They go to the, seven, the village, travel seven days, slept in a grave, concocted a charm, put it in your house successfully. You wake up, you match it. You know, there's a level where you want to match it. The Holy Ghost say, no, don't go out. 
there's another level where you match it. They are now waiting for you to die. Because the law of the charm said in two hours you will die. Six hours later, they see you dancing and singing and celebrating. And they are wondering what happened. No weapon fashioned against me shall prosper. No weapon. The gates of hell shall not prosper against me. Because I have come into a fortress. That's why the Bible said the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run it therein. They took your name to a shrine. Put your picture under the mat. The herbalist is lying on it. They carry the deity and put on it. They assume that you will not prosper. The next time they check, you have visa to London. You are coming back. You have another appointment in Dubai. As you are coming back, they are inviting you for a project in New York. And they are wondering, what is happening here? Jesus has become the fragrance of your life. I'm telling you, about the excellency of knowing Jesus. This is why the primary preoccupation of the apostles is to preach Christ. They say we preach Christ and him crucified. We preach him. We preach him. If you know him, it's enough. The generation must rise and know Jesus. They say you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, this scripture reveals to us a dimension of Jesus that is enough for the church to be built. But this is not all. Because if you want to know Jesus, there are four dimensions from which you must know him. Number one, you must know him as God the Son. Number two, you must know him as the Son of God. Number three, you must know him as the Son of Man. And number four, you must know him as the Christ. God the Son and Son of God are not the same. In this scripture, Peter revealed Son of God and Christ. There are two more revelations. God the Son and Son of Man. If you know these four revelations of Jesus, you will, your life will become a wonder. Very quickly, in the next 25 minutes, let me attempt to show you Jesus in these four offices. As God the Son, as Son of God, as Son of Man, and as the Christ. And I trust that the Holy Ghost will alight on my words and, then, and reveal Jesus to your heart. Because no man can know the Son except him that the Father reveals him. So my job is to preach and trust that the Holy Ghost will interpret to your heart. And I'm persuaded he will. Let's begin from God the Son. When we call Jesus God the Son, we are referring to him as the second person of the Godhead. Because when you begin to study God, you will discover that the way God is revealed to man is as a Godhead. In fact, if you study your Bible, every scripture where you see the Bible say God is one God. You will notice that the word one is not the word absolute one. It's the word the unity of one. They are two different things. And I need to explain it to you. The Bible said, Hear, 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 hear O ye Israel, the Lord your God is one God. There are two types of one in the Bible. There is one which is absolute one and there is one which is the plurality of one. For example, if I come here and I say Nigeria, I'm talking about one nation. But Nigeria has many tribes and many people. But it's what? It's one nation. So when you are calling God one, there is a sense in which you are, you are talking about the community of the Godhead. And then when you are calling God one, there is a sense in which you are talking about an absolute one. So in the Bible, you are going to find in Hebrew, the word yachid and the word ichad for one. Yachid is absolute one in its mathematical sense. Ichad is the word community of one. Most times when you refer to God, is the word ichad, the plurality of one. Just like a university is one school. But there are many schools in the university. You see school of languages, school of politics, school of science, 
but the whole thing is one school. That's community of one. Even in the Greek, the word one, you'll find the word monos and you'll find the word his. Every time God is mentioned, the word one used is the word his. I don't want to bamboozle you with Greek and Hebrew, but I'm trying to show you a concept. Are you following this? Now, when the Bible refers to Jesus as God the Son, he's introducing Jesus as co-equal with the Father and the Holy Ghost, co-equal, co-eternal with the Father and the Holy Ghost, and coexistent with the Father and the Holy Ghost. Because in the community of the Godhead, there are three manifestations of beings, but there is one essence of being. How do I explain that? The Bible teaches us in Romans chapter 1, from verse 19 and 20, that the easiest way to understand the Godhead is to look at nature. He said, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God had showed it unto them. Verse 20, he said, for the invincible things of him from creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead that they have no excuse. So this scripture is telling us that the mystery of the Godhead is revealed by nature. So if you want to understand the Godhead, if you can't understand it theologically, he said, look at nature. And I want to use an illustration to show you how God exists using nature. If you pick water, essentially speaking, water is one commodity. For those of us who are scientists, water is H2O. But you see, that is the reality of water in its chemical environment. Now, when you want to manifest sea water in physical manifestation, water manifests in three forms. Water can be steam, water can be ice block, and water can be liquid. Steam is not ice block. Ice block is not what liquid, but ice block, steam, and liquid are all H2O. So when we are talking about God, he is one person, he is one being. But in manifestation, he manifests as father, he manifests as son, he manifests as spirit. Spirit is not son, son is not father, but both father, son, and spirit is God. So God is one, but he manifests in three beings. Now, Jesus is the second person in that manifestation of God. So if you don't know this, you may call him a prophet. You won't call him God. This is why when he said, who do men say I am? They were rating him at the level of a prophet. And all the religions in the world called him a prophet because they don't know that he is God. Co-equal with the Father, co-equal with the Spirit. Co-eternal with the Father, co-eternal with the Spirit. And co-existent with the Father and co-existence with the Spirit. So the first revelation of Jesus you must have is that he is God or the second person of the Godhead. That is God the Son. So God the Son is God. If you don't know this, you will be shouting Jesus, Jesus. It won't mean much to you. That's why some people have accident or they are in a challenge. Jesus, 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 Jesus. It's like a song. They don't know when they called that name, they invoked God. They, they, they can be sinning. People are sinning and they say, Jesus. In the middle of sin, they don't know that they are talking about God because they have no revelation that he is God the Son. The moment you know that he's God the Son, the majesty of God, the consciousness of the majesty of God will come into his name. And when you call that name, anything can happen. When you find the name of Jesus powerless, on the lips of Christians is because they don't know God the Son. If I have time to show you who God is, you will be shocked. There are three things that makes God God. The first is His essential attributes. The second is His moral attributes. The third are His offices. His essential attributes are His incommunicable attributes. He can't share with anybody. And there are seven of them. His moral attributes are the attributes that he can share with creation. There are four of them. 
and the, his offices are the position he occupies that only him can occupy and there are two of them let me list it for you so that you go and do your study <laughs> you know the, the, the conference this time requires that a teaching priest should bring the oracles of God that's why I'm doing what I'm doing it's not just a manifestation no we, we need to teach so that you have this I'm talking about God the son let me show you the seven essential attributes of God that only God has number one God is eternal you know what that means it means he has no beginning he has no end that's why Bible, the Bible calls him the ancient of days he is existence nothing was before him and nothing is after him no beginning no end first timothy 1 17 calls him he said now unto the king eternal immortal invincible the only wise god so all of us are in a pool of god he's the one who was who is and who is to come that's who god is Number two essential attribute, he is self-existent. You know what that means? He exists in and from himself. All of us come from God, but God came from God. You came from God, but God came from God. So he exists in and from himself. And that's not all. He exists for himself. You exist to please God. God exists to please God. You don't exist for yourself. If you exist for yourself, you will say, come. Your life will leave your body. But God exists from himself. And that's not all. Self-existent means that he doesn't depend on anybody to be God. But you depend on him to be human. So if God does not exist, you won't exist. But if you don't exist, God will still exist. That's what self-existent means. So, Exodus 3.14, he said, Go tell Pharaoh, I am that I am have sent you. That's self-existent. I live for myself. I live from myself. I live for my purpose. I don't depend on anyone to exist. But everything depends on me. Anything you call me, I become that thing because I am self-existent. That's what it means. That's who God is. No other creature is like that. No other creature is eternal. And that's not all. He's, he is immutable. That means God is unchanging and God is unchangeable. Unchanging means God does not change. Unchangeable means you can't change him. Malachi 3 verse 6, he said, I am the Lord, I change not. He says, so you, the sons of Jacob, are not consumed. This is why you can trust God. Anything God tells you, go and sleep, it will happen. But if you don't know that it's immutable, you can't trust it. If I tell you now that tomorrow I will give you a car, you have to pray to tomorrow. Because even if my character is right, what if I don't wake up? I'm mad. And then I may be bringing the car to you and the car may have accident or I may misplace the car. But God is always there. And anything he says, if God wants to give you something, even if that thing is lost, he will create it again. So he can be trusted. That's immutability. I'm showing you what makes God God. And all of these things I'm showing you, Jesus is those things. So when you say Jesus, you are calling the eternal one. You are calling the self-existence one. You are calling the immutable one. And that's not all. He's omnipotent. Omnipotent means he has all power to do all things. Nothing is impossible with him. And then he has the power to put his power under his power. That means God cannot be corrupt by power. As we are talking here, if you give me certain levels of power, I will become proud and arrogant. If you give me certain levels of power, I may start doing things that I'm not supposed to do, not God. Every power God has, he has it under control. And he has the power to do anything he wants. He is omnipotent. Revelations 19 verse 6. He said, and I heard the voice of a great multitude and as the sound of many waters and mighty thundering saying, hallelujah, the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. 
All power belongs to him. And that's not all. He's omniscient. That means he knows all things at all times, in all times, within himself and in all creation. I wish you know what that means. He knows all things at all times mean, means everything happening now, everywhere in the world, God knows it. He knows all things in all times means everything that has happened before, he already knows it. And everything that will happen, he already knows it. God knows everything that will happen tomorrow. He knows everything that will happen this year and next year until time ends. And that's not all. He knows everything inside himself. You don't know half of the thing inside you. Have you seen your liver before? Have you seen your kidney before? <laughs> Have you seen your intestine before? God knows everything inside God. And God knows everything inside creation. That's omniscient. His knowledge is infinite. I'm showing you what makes God God. So that when we say Jesus is God the Son, you will know what we are talking about. When we see, you know, we don't know him enough. Oh. We don't know the excellency of Jesus Christ. That's why when we call him, we make him a religious figure. Before religion, he was. Before Christianity, he was. This is who he is. This is the pre-incarnate reality of Christ. He is omnipresent. You know what omnipresent is? He is everywhere at every time and in every time. That means God is everywhere now. And God is not just everywhere now. God is still in yesterday. In everywhere yesterday. You have left yesterday. God is still there. If God leaves yesterday, the world will collapse. And God is already in tomorrow. Because if God is not in tomorrow, the world will still collapse. Because the world is like a cycle. If you break one part, the whole system will crash. You left yesterday, God is in yesterday. You left last year, last year, God is still in last year. And God is already in next year. God is in next millennium. He is in every time. That's what it means to be omnipresent. And he's in every place. Even every circumstance that all of us are going through here, God is there. If you become conscious of it, he can now manifest his power. He is not just omnipresent. He is not just omniscient. He is not just omnipotent. He is not just immutable. He is not just self-existent. He is not just eternal. He is omnibenevolent. God is the only one who loves forever and ever unconditionally. If God says, I love you, he loves you regardless of what you do or who you become. Because for him, love is not an emotion. For him, love is a power that makes him give himself unconditionally. That's why it is nature to love. In 1 John chapter 4 verse 8, the Bible said, God is love. That's who God is. No other being is like this. Only God is like this. And this is not all. God occupies offices. He is the only creator. That means only God can bring something out of nothing. As advanced as science is, science cannot create a natural blade of grass. Anything science does comes from something. We form, God creates. You form when you have a raw material. You create when you have no raw material. Genesis 1 verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's not all. God is a life giver. He's the only one who has the source of all life. That means if you trace every creation back to the first one, they came from one creation, one, one being. Who is the creator? The life giver. And all of these things is who Jesus is. When we say Jesus is God the Son, we are saying Jesus is eternal. We are saying Jesus is immutable. We are saying Jesus is self-existent. We are saying Jesus is omnipotent. We are saying Jesus is omniscient. We are saying Jesus is omnipresent. And somebody is asking, if he was omnipotent when he was walking, if he was omnipresent when he was walking on earth, why was he not everywhere? That's why you need to know the Son of God. 
Because when you are talking about God the Son, you are talking about his reality before he became man. And if you study the Bible, both in the Old and New Testament, you will find this. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. Look at the description of Jesus before he became man. He said, therefore the Lord himself shall give us a sign. He said, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. So before he was with us, he existed. And that's not all. Go to Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 and 7. See who they call Jesus. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. He said the government of this world shall be upon his shoulder. What is his name? See his name. His name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor. What? Mighty God. So the son is what? Mighty God. See the fourth one. Jesus is everlasting father. So before he became man, he is also father. So when you are saying father, father, you are also calling Jesus. It's when he became man that he relinquished the authority of the father to God the father. But in eternity past, the father, the son, and the spirit are all father. They are all son and they are all spirit. That's why they called him here everlasting father. Because he is co-equal, co-eternal with the father. And then you find the same in the New Testament. That Jesus was also called God in the New Testament. John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the world. The world was with God. And the world was God. So the world was God. You ask him, who is the world? Verse 14. The world became flesh and dwelt among us. So when we call him eternal, immutable, omnipotent, omniscient, we are referring to who he was before he took on flesh. Because flesh is a face in his transition to fulfill divine administration. But most of us don't know who Jesus is. We thought Jesus began from a child that Virgin Mary gave birth to. And that's why we think he's a religious figure only for Christians. Jesus is the God and the Lord of all. He is not just a prophet. They missed him when they called him a prophet. And some of you here, unconsciously, you think he's a prophet. You think he's a teacher. You think he's a miracle worker. And so your relationship with him ends at the level of performance. When you need healing, you go to Jesus. When you need money, you go to Jesus. When you need deliverance, you go to Jesus. You don't know that he is the only true God. That's why you use him to meet your need, but you don't worship him. You don't serve him. Jesus can tell some people, I've seen many Christians, they love Jesus, we tell them, don't drink again. They will tell you, Kai, even Jesus told me not to drink again, but my brother, I did try. And that's much more. Some people, Jesus will tell them, go to this city, serve me. They'll say, God told me five years ago to go my brother see me. I never feel go. Because they know him as a miracle worker. They know him as a prophet. They don't know him as God the son. The day you know him as God the son, you will worship him as the only true God. That's the first place to know him from. And then when you know him as God the son, you now need to know him as the son of God. That's the revelation Peter spoke about. As the son of God. What does it mean to be the son of God? Son of God is not biological process. You know, there are many religions of the world today, they argue. When you say Jesus is the son of God, they start asking you, does God have a wife? That's low level thinking. Because even among living organisms, not every creature who has son has wife. An amoeba can divide into two. It doesn't need a wife to produce an offspring. For those of you who know biology, the way Amoeba gives birth is that it divides into two. So the first one is Amoeba, the second one is Amoeba. That's the lowest organisms on earth. So asking questions like, is, does God have wife? How does he have a son? Means you don't have spiritual intelligence. When we say Jesus is the son of God, what we are saying is that this is the God that came from God. 
let me explain it to you. See, when a man talks, like I'm talking to you now, you hear sound. But when God talks, the word of God is beyond sound. When God talks, God comes out. And the, did you not read your Bible? Genesis 3 verse 8. The Bible said the voice of God came walking in the garden. And they heard the voice of God walking where? In the garden. Does voice walk? When a man talks, you hear sound. But when God talks, the voice is God. He walks. So the voice of God can come and meet you. And he will be God. So if God stands here and God said, I will move that iron from point A to point B. The moment God said it, you will see God move and God will move the iron. God will still be sitting, but God will be moving the iron. The God that is sitting is called Father. The one moving the iron is called Son. So when we say Son of God, we are not saying the lower God. No. We are saying the God that left the one that spoke. But the one moving and the one talking is the same God. If you read your Bible, John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Verse 14. That word that was God became flesh. So God the son is the son of God is the one that proceed from the father. It doesn't mean he's smaller than the father. It simply means according to divine administration, God does God cannot move from his throne. But God has many things God wants to do. So while God is yet sitting on his throne, God can still be doing what he wants to do. So the God that is doing what God wants to do is the one running the errand. The God that is on the throne is now the father. It doesn't mean the one that left is smaller. It's just the way God works. This is why God does not need anybody to be God. Because if God wants to do anything, God can sit down and talk. And while God is yet sitting, God can leave God and go and do what God wants to do. So the God that is sitting is Father. The God that goes is Son. That's what the Son of God means. So Jesus is the one who proceeds from the Father. And this is why when you read your Bible, the Bible calls him the express image of God. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. He said, but has in these last days spoken to us by what? His son, whom he appointed heir of all things and by whom he also what? Made the world. So the son is the creator of the world. To tell you that he is also God. Next verse, he said, who being the brightness of his glory. The express image. So, when we talk son of God, we are talking the God that you can see. The God that proceeds from the father to run the errand of the father. It doesn't mean he is a lower God. It means according to divine administration, God wants to do something by himself. Something he cannot delegate. So, the God that is delegated from God is called son. Why the God that remains is called Father. That's what the Son of God is. And so when you encounter Jesus, you are encountering God in visible form. You are encountering the God that runs the errand of God. It doesn't mean that it's smaller. There are many questions that people begin to ask from scriptures and I show you a few of them as we attempt to, to deal with this matter. In John 14, 28, they say Jesus himself said the father is greater than I. That is a subject of administration. Because if you read that scripture, he's talking about him being sent. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you love me, you will rejoice. Because I said, I go unto the father. For the father is greater than I. So he's talking in the context of the errand that is running. I was teaching my people this and I gave them an illustration. I said, Maybe you have two generals and they want to conquer a territory. And two of the generals, two of equal rank, one said, you become a spy and enter that city as a spy. And the general, because he cannot go as a spy 
wearing all the regalia of a general. He will have to go like maybe a cleaner or a teacher. He will remove the, all the stars and all his rank. And he will enter that city, sometimes even as a slave. So that nobody can see him. It's a disguise. In order for him to get information for a mission to be accomplished. All the time that he's in that nation, he is lower than the one who is here. Because he cannot exercise the authority of a general. Not because he's not a general. He is a general, but if he functions as a general, the mission will fail. So for the period that he's working as a spy, this general is greater. Because this one can work as a general. He can only work as a spy. You see that? But when the mission is accomplished and he returns, maybe he was working in somebody's house as a dry cleaner. The person will now come to the nation and see the dry cleaner. The dry cleaner will go back to his original status and he will put on his regalia as a general. You will be wondering, were you not my dry cleaner? He said, I was dry cleaner for a mission. Now mission has been accomplished. I am actually a general. Do you know that if this general meets that dry cleaner, they will salute themselves as colleagues. But nobody will know because they are on an assignment. So when Jesus came to save man, if he came as God, God can't die. How can he save man? So the Bible said in Philippians chapter 2 from verse 5, it said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What did he do? Who being in the form of God, Taught it not robbery to be equal with God. If you do, we have NLT or the message version so that they will understand it. Go back to, to, to verse 6. He said, Though he was God, he did not think equality with God as something to cling to. So this scripture is telling you Jesus is God, but he didn't hold on to it because if he holds on to it, he can't die. If he holds on to it, if you approach, they can't arrest him. Even with the level he condescended, when they came to arrest him, he said, Whom seek ye? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. They say, I am he. They fell down. Imagine if he came as God. Who can arrest him? Salvation would not have been possible. So the reason he condescended was for the mission of salvation. So go back to the scripture. He said he was equal with God. He didn't cling to it. Verse 7. He said, instead, he gave up his divine privileges he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form verse 8 he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross so the reason he condescended was so that he can go to the cross because if he cannot go to the cross man could not be saved and no angel can save man only God can run this errand. So what God did was that God sat on his throne and God came out of his throne. The God that left the throne entered the womb of a woman and was born as a man. Functioned as a slave so that he could be arrested. And they nailed him to the cross. 